So they won't necessarily just be a president. I'm sure. They have a, I'm sure for one or two. Right. But a lot of them they were Well, there's only five, so. There's only five of them. Yeah, as long as you have a Good. And how do you know that? I guess you, you guys do talk about it. Yeah. Thank you. Pleasure. This is great. Yeah, We're looking forward to this. I'm sorry that we have. I mean, the people drifted. Yeah. It's it's yeah, it's it's too close to finals, yeah. and the students are too self-centered. Yeah. They need to be reminded, I guess. A little, little bit of like. The problem is you can't beat them anymore. No, they've been beating too much. <laughs> no, but it's, it's just a big problem. lump of soft flesh now. They're just they're just they're still just recovering from going away. You know, this is the problem. They go away for spring break because they all think they're an undergrad. I'm trying to see if there's any of your students that we've talked to. About. Yeah, Allison is here. Bo's coming down. Um, yeah, three or four. Well, yeah, I seem to right. see a few pieces. Well, Allison's the only one I see for sh for certain right now, but a couple more will come in. <laughs> there's too much stuff. There's five lectures. Oh, yeah. None of them would be as good as this one. Well, of course, of course. <laughs> I, I know that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Um, you guys can actually sit in the... In Thank you very much for coming. My name is Gavin Browning. I'm the director of events and public programs here at Columbia GSAP. And I'd like to welcome you to the sixth and final installment of the series, Where is New York? Which has been taking place during the 2011-2012 year here at GSAP. And the concept of this series is um, that different departments at GSAP choose sites of interest to their discipline within the past year. And that they bring together different stakeholders in the creation of those spaces 
with the hope of creating interdisciplinary conversation. So, so far this year, we've looked at Corona Plaza, Willits Point, Queens, Pier 42 on the Lower East Side, the building HL23 on the High Line, and the Park Avenue Armory through the lenses of historic preservation, real estate development, urban planning, urban design, and curatorial practice in architecture. And I'm really pleased to welcome the architecture program this evening, and I'd like to thank Amal Andros, um, a new professor here at Columbia, and also um, of the firm Work AC. You probably know the firm from their winning entry to the MoMA PS1 Young Architects program in 2008 called PF1, in which they built an urban farm in the courtyard of PS1 in Long Island City. Um, also for their excellent exhibition at Storefront for Art and Architecture, 49 Cities, and um, accompanying publication. And most recently, Work AC has contributed ideas for public housing in Kaiser, Oregon, as part of the MoMA exhibition, Foreclosed, Rehousing the American Dream, which is on display now at MoMA, and I encourage all of you to go down and, and see that along with the other proposals. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Amal. Thank you. Thanks, Gavin. Um, the Via Verde development in the South Bronx, New York is the winning response to a new housing New York legacy competition, which was organized in 2006 and subsequently made um, possible uh, in great part to HPD's contribution. The team consisting of a partnership between two architects and two developers, Grimshaw uh, and Datner Associates on the one hand, and Jonathan Rose Companies and Phipps House on the other, presented an enticing vision for a new model of green and healthy urban living. The 1.5 acre mixed use new construction development uh, features 221 uh, mixed income residential units, retail and community facilities, as well as a 35,000 square foot green roof. With a mix of sales and rental units, I believe it's one third, two third, a wide range of housing typologies and sizes, from studios to three bedrooms and from row houses to high rise living, as well as a diversity of landscapes from terraced seating to orchard gardens, edible gardens, uh, swooping up to become a series of green roofs, some accessible and some not. The development presents itself as an incredibly thoughtful and carefully uh, designed uh, project, a sort of, I felt like it was, I visited it a few days ago and it was like a library of best practices. It was like anything you can think of, it was there, <laughs> with a renewed faith in what architecture and design can do. Welcomed with uh, raving reviews by the New York Times architecture critic earlier this year, uh, another recent um, Wall Street Journal article also recently appeared, highlighting the complexity and challenges that a development such as Via Verde still poses to a difficult neighborhood such as the South Bronx. Uh, which is a sort of living map uh, of all possible uh, past housing typologies to learn from. It is those promises and those uh, tensions that I'm hoping we will explore this evening with our great group of speakers um, representing the various parts of the teams. And so without further ado, I wanted to introduce um, uh, the group who will be speaking. Um, so first, um, we have Elizabeth Gomer, um, from who is the Director of Housing Policy Research and Program Evaluation at the New York City Department of Housing Preservation and Development, where she leads the agency's effort to evaluate its impact on families and neighborhoods in support of evidence-based policy making. Ongoing projects include analysis of residential foreclosures in New York City, a quasi-experimental study of mixed income housing on the social networks of low-income movers, and a risk assessment of families that enter homeless shelters. Her team is leading the study that will evaluate, or, or has led this, or will lead the study that, that has, will evaluate, is leading, uh, how, how Via Verde impacts the health and well-being of those who move uh, to, the, to the development. Then our first speaker will be Paul Freitag. Uh, 
Um, Paul is, as the Director of Development for Jonathan Rose Companies in New York, Paul Freitag oversees the firm's full range of real estate development work in the region, bringing extensive experience redeveloping underutilized properties for affordable housing and social service programs in both the private uh, and the non-for-profit sectors throughout the New York metropolitan area. Current development uh, projects include Tapestry, a new 185-unit uh, mixed-income 50-30-20 rental residential building in East Harlem, and another 114-unit affordable and supportive housing development in Harlem, New York, both pursuing uh, aggressive lead uh, qualification. Mr. Freitag's team recently completed David and Joyce Dinkins Gardens, the first 100% affordable green housing development in Harlem. Guano's Green is another project uh, which Jonathan Rose Company recently won and is also a mixed-use green development featuring 774 units of low and mixed-income mixed rental cooperatives and condominiums, um, again with uh, very great uh, emphasis on LEED. And so Mr. Freitag is a registered architect and lead accredited professional with more than 20 years of experience in green planning, design, and real estate development. He's a frequent speaker on green affordable housing. Um, Paul will be followed by Bill Stein and uh, Robert Garneau, who will speak uh, together. Uh, Bill Stein joined Richard Datner and Associates uh, in 1979. His collaborative approach builds consensus among participants and users to achieve design excellence within the constraints of the public design and construction process. He manages the firm's transit projects and has directed projects for New York City Transit and the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey. Residential projects include senior citizens' residences for the New York Foundation for Senior Citizens, projects for the New York City Housing Authority and housing for the mentally ill um, and homeless. Institutional projects include the Bronx Borough Center Library, the Parkchester and Cypress Hills Libraries, Columbia University Stadium, Public School 234, and the 33rd Precinct Station House for the NYPD. Um, Bill serves as Vice President for Professional Development of the AIA New York Chapter and is the President of the New York Foundation for Architecture, uh, where he has led the Foundation's transition to a more activist role in promoting public awareness of architecture and the built environment. Robert Garneau. Uh, Robert joined uh, Grimshaw in 2003 and is the New York lead for the firm's environmental design management. Robert has primary roles on a range of Grimshaw projects, applying first principles to the design process and ensuring design excellence. Projects include the Fulton Street Tran Transit Center in Lower Manhattan and the winning entry for a new affordable housing project via Verde. Robert is dedicated to sustainable design as an inherent responsibility for architects uh, while designing built environments and engaging ecological contexts. He was an early adopter of the green building movement, becoming a lead accredited professional and a USGBC member in 2001. He is a registered architect in New York State with NCARB certification and is the, a member of the AIA. He has a Bachelor of Architecture as well as a Bachelor of Environmental Studies um, and his focus has really been uh, on ecological building design. And finally, uh, we will end with uh, Michael Wadman. Uh, from Michael Wadman joined uh, Phipps Houses in 2007 and is responsible for property acquisition, land development, structuring, financing, and closing mixed-use developments. Prior to joining Phipps Houses, Michael was managing partner of Hudson Affordable Housing LLC, where he developed a pipeline of 2,000 affordable housing units, including Gowanus Green, a large mixed-use project in the Gowanus neighborhood of Brooklyn. He also spent eight years at the New York State Housing Finance Agency, most recently as the senior vice president of housing, overseeing the origination of more than a billion in financing for affordable housing throughout New York State. In addition, Michael has been a community development leader with J.P. Morgan Chase, as well as an associate at the New York City Department of Housing and Preservation Development. He currently serves as board president of Neighbors Helping Neighbors, a Brooklyn-based nonprofit non housing organization. Um, please welcome Paul as our first speaker.
Uh, no, Liz, actually. Liz will start. Thank you very much. Uh, give us one second here. Let me just pull up my slides. <clears throat> Terrific. Okay. That's really big. Sorry for all of that. Anybody who's sitting close. Um, so first off, let me just um, say thank you for the invitation to participate in this really terrific uh, Yep, please. <laughs> um, panel and um, generally for this opportunity to talk about this pretty remarkable project. Um, so what I'd like to do um, is sort of set the stage um, for the, the context in which Via Verde um, was designed, built, and now is being leased up. Um, so I'm going to try to keep my remarks brief, but I want to try and cover two things. Um, the first is to talk about just generally the need for affordable housing in New York City, very briefly, um, and as a context itself for all of the really remarkable and substantial amounts of investment that have been made to preserve and expand that stock here in New York City over the last few years. Um, and the second thing that I wanted to do, and particularly with this wonderful panel um, of uh, Via Verde uh, developers, um, is to talk a little bit about our ongoing efforts to actually quantify the impact of these public investments on the health and well-being of low-income residents here in New York. Um, and that includes, I'm very happy to say, Via Verde is one of our study sites for this multi-million dollar uh, study that is currently um, about maybe a third of the way done. Um, and hopefully I'll be able to briefly share some of our early findings um, as a starting point for thinking about how we expect and hope Via Verde will go above and beyond all of those remarkable contributions. Um, so with that, <clears throat> um, it's best to start at the beginning. I'm a researcher and so I like to think about these things. Um, so uh, I think everybody in this room probably knows, but two out of every three New Yorkers rent their home. Um, that's pretty remarkable and very different, obviously, than the rest of the U.S. Um, and we're a large city, uh, which means that that's equivalent to 2.1 million households and more than 5 million persons. That's a lot of renters. And I'm going to focus on renters here tonight in my remarks, although, of course, one of the really remarkable things about Via Verde is the fact that it's this mixed tenure, mixed income community in the South Bronx. So this graph shows the income distribution of renter-occupied households here in New York. Um, these are the most current data that we have available. And the call out here is the median income of renter households in New York, which is 38,500. Um, just as a, a sort of benchmark for homeowners in New York City, the median income is 75,000. So we have this really dramatic stratification of our population. Um, and the general rule of thumb that we use in housing policy across the country is that a household should pay no more than about a third of their income toward housing costs. So for this typical family that earns $38,500, that's equivalent to about $960 a month on all housing costs. Um, that's, that's that 30% benchmark. Um, but in New York City, we all live here. We know that it's a very expensive place to live. Um, the median rent right now is $1,100 in New York, not $960, which is what the typical family can afford to pay. Um, that's equivalent to $1,204 when we factor in utility costs, which of course are also very high. And the median rent for vacant units that are available right now on the market is $1,300. Um, so all of that, of course, leads to very high prevalence of rent burden um, across the income distribution. Um, so this is the same distribution that we're looking at now, but the red here shows the proportion within, in, in, within each income group that is rent burdened or paying more on housing costs than they should right now. Um, in New York City, so across every income, one half of all renter households pay more than 30% of income on rent, a half. And a third of renter households pay more than half of their income toward rent. So, I, I mean, if we think about that, that's, that's actually quite stunning. Um, and of course, of, of immense concern, not just to us in the world of affordable housing, um, but in all different domains of policy making and support, particularly for low income households. Uh, so if we take that fact and we disaggregate it a little bit more, here's what we get. Uh, so in the lowest income strata, that's the first three bars on the left there, 
um, about 43% of renters in those incomes uh, are rent burdened right now, wherever they live. Uh, that's equivalent to about 266,000 families. But if we look at the next group, which is in the blue, the next four bars, um, which is, by the way, the income group that it, the rental units at Via Verde are targeted to, 62% um, of those families are rent burdened. Now that's a little bit counterintuitive that slightly higher income would have greater rent burden, um, but in fact that is exactly the way that it works. And the reason is really um, twofold. We'll talk about this in a second. Um, the first is that the lowest income groups generally qualify for a variety of programs, sort of the social safety net. It's really, those are targeted to households that are at or close to the federal poverty level and it means that they're already receiving multiple forms of assistance, including rental assistance for housing. But the next group um, is really becoming increasingly the focus of a lot of different kinds of policies. It is particularly of concern for affordable housing uh, people here in New York. Um, but these are households that really struggle to make ends meet, particularly in high cost places like New York, but not only New York, also Boston, Los Angeles, Chicago. Um, and yet they earn too much to qualify for pretty much any form of public program. So this is the working population that is low income. Um, in fact, it stretches in New York all the way up through the median income, so it's a huge chunk of our uh, working and middle class here in New York, and they're really struggling to, to pay for housing in the private market. Uh, so this shows the distribution of uh, subsidized rental units in New York. We're actually very lucky to have a strong, large, and healthy subsidized housing stock that actually stretches across a pretty wide distribution of the rental, renter population. Um, but you see on the left here uh, the number of units that are targeted to those lowest income groups, um, including public housing, vouchers, and also a number of other entitlement and support programs, uh, such as those for the disabled or the aged. Um, but that really vulnerable population, that sort of low income second group, um, in the past really has lacked opportunities to be able to have subsidized housing and or have other forms of support. Um, and the blue here is actually the units that are currently being uh, preserved or constructed through uh, the 11 year New York City uh, housing plan uh, called the New Housing Marketplace Plan or NHMP. Um, and this is actually a really, really remarkable investment in affordable housing. Um, truly unique to New York, but hopefully um, a starting point for other municipalities um, and HUD to be able to pick up sort of this gauntlet. Um, so NHMP will build or preserve 165,000 units of affordable housing by 2014. Um, that is by far the largest uh, housing plan in U.S. history. Just as comparison, uh, Chicago is currently also in the midst of its 10 or 11 year plan, um, the CHA transformation, um, and that will build or preserve 25,000 units of housing during the same time frame. So it gives you a sense of the scale of investment. Um, and of course, that second bar, you can see uh, the height of that, that blue stacked bar. Those are the units, including Via Verde, um, that are targeted to this low-income working population. It's about 80% of the units. Uh, this is the location of the building's finance to date. Um, so what's equally remarkable, particularly in these current financial times that we're all facing, is that we're actually on target to finish this 165,000 units um, on time and within budget. Um, to date, we've already uh, financed almost 130,000 units. Um, uh, so that's pretty remarkable. Um, and that includes uh, almost 40,000 units in the Bronx as a borough up at the top. Um, and in Community District 1 in the Bronx in Melrose, which is where Via Verde is located, um, we financed almost 6,600 units already to date. Um, so it's a really remarkable public investment. Um, and, and of course, we believe valuable not only to the individuals, um, but also to the neighborhoods in the city as a whole. Um, so moving on to the second part of what I would just like to cover. Um, 
Evaluating and quantifying the impact of these kinds of public investments, um, we really consider at HPD and, and frankly across all of the agencies that work here in the city of New York to be an essential component of good policy making. Um, and so in conjunction with this very large effort to build or preserve such an enormous volume of affordable housing is also an equal commitment um, to be able to evaluate and really understand what those investments are doing for the people in neighborhoods where they are, are being completed. Um, so we are currently um, in the midst of the New York City Housing and Neighborhood Demonstration Project, um, which is a randomized control trial that will follow 3,000 families that apply for newly constructed affordable housing financed under the plan um, through the first three years after time of application or move-in. Um, for the people who end up moving. Um, randomized control trial is sort of the gold standard in evaluation. It's um, the sort of study design that is most frequently used to evaluate uh, drug interventions, uh, health promoting programs, and we're actually using that same design here to evaluate our intervention, which is receipt of affordable housing. Um, so we're partnered with some great people, including Jeannie Brooks Gunn here at Columbia. Um, and all of, all of this effort, um, which is of course, very long range itself, um, it is funded from outside resources too. So this is very important to us that we're not actually taking away from the actual work and the creation of housing by doing this evaluation, but that we're actually drawing additional resources to be able to study, uh, create new knowledge and hopefully transform that and show the value of this kind of work, um, not only here in New York, but hopefully so that it can be transplanted elsewhere. <clears throat> very briefly. Um, when we think about how to evaluate this, um, at its most basic el level, um, there are two sets of mechanisms by which any affordable housing can actually impact people's well-being. Um, the first is through lowered housing costs, or at least establishing a low affordable housing cost, if not lowering it for individuals, and by increasing the quality of housing while holding that cost at an affordable level for the family who lives there. Um, those are great things in and of themselves, of course, um, but we really believe that that's actually just the starting point for really transforming people's lives in other kinds of ways. Um, so we expect that, that these sort of basic housing context um, can actually help to support greater financial stability for these low-income households, um, which itself is at least one form of chronic strain for families. Um, that actually improving housing quality can reduce exposure to triggers, um, such as uh, pests, molds, uh, all of these kinds of things. That can also improve other forms of physical health as a result, the symptomology of those. And that all of those things together can help families to really build financial, human, and social capital over the long term. <clears throat> um, I'm really excited about the work that I do and that we do. Um, and so I, I take every chance that I can to share just uh, some very high level findings already from this study. Um, so even though the study itself won't be done until about 2014, 2015, something like that, um, we have been really anxious to see the, the value over time. Uh, so this is actually from a pilot study where we followed 250 households um, that had applied for one affordable housing development actually located in Brooklyn, a mixed income development. Um, and what we see here, so the blue bars are our treatment group. So those are families that received housing and moved into this affordable housing complex. Um, and the gray are our control households. Those are families that are similar in every way but were not offered housing because there were too many applicants for the number of apartments available. It's the only difference. Uh, and these differences and these four outcomes are only 20 months after the treatment families moved in. So this is an incredibly short change that we see. Um, so to go over it uh, from left to right, treatment families are significantly less likely to be concerned about their finances and making ends meet. They're significantly less likely to have reported delaying health care for financial reasons. So this is how we see this actually affecting other domains of people's lives. Um, they're marginally less likely to be anxious or clinically depressed, right? So this is really spreading out further. And remember, only in 20 months' time. Um, and last and perhaps most substantial is that we see that treatment households, the families who live there, are significantly less likely to have had asthma symptoms and attacks within the last 12 months. So this is not a green site. This is sort of our, our most basic form of newly constructed affordable housing. 
and it's high quality, but it's not designed uh, in essence to, to improve health. And yet we see that in multiple domains that affordable housing has the potential to really transform people's well-being. Um, what we didn't see at this site, at this non-green site, was any differences, at least statistically significant differences in health behaviors, right? We didn't see any difference in the number of servings of vegetables that they ate, uh, or physical activity, or the number of stairs that they climbed on a daily basis, um, which we sort of honestly expected to see, but we didn't. Um, so we saw great things, really wonderful potential, but not in these key aspects. Uh, and of course, this is exactly what buildings like Via Verde are designed to do, is to help move that lever to improve diet, to increase physical activity, um, and to do so in a building of community and social engagement within this sort of very diverse group within the South Bronx. Um, so we expect that sites, including Via Verde, but possibly others similar to it in its design elements, um, can of course do what we've already seen in our more typical kinds of construction, but then above and beyond that, that if we can also really improve health behaviors, that we've tr added tremendous value and, and really shown the benefit of these kinds of investments. Um, so I will leave it at that and just say that we are right now, in fact today, up until about five o'clock recruiting families um, who applied for the rental units at Via Verde. Uh, all of this is a study of rental households, so we're not tracking the co-op owners. Um, but 7,000 families applied for the 133 units that, that were actually marketed through our lottery process. Um, and so we're collecting baseline data, um, we're watching who moves in, um, and right now our funding will enable us to go back and interview uh, not only the adults in the household, but also the children who move into Via Verde as well. So that's it, and I look forward to coming back in a couple of years and sharing our findings with you. Thank you very much. Okay, so I have a very fun task of just sort of setting the stage for the uh, Via Verde um, uh, competition. So Via Verde is an extraordinary building, but I think it's, you know, it's an extraordinary building that was actually the result of an extraordinary process. And what this was, was the city of New York combined, the HPD a co combined with the New York City chapter of the AIA and NYSERDA, the New York State um, Energy Research and Development Corporation, came together in order to to sponsor the first design competition for affordable housing in New York City in a generation. Now, there's all sorts of affordable housing which is generated in New York through the process of an RFP, a request for proposals. But typically, those RFPs say, you know, we want you to, on this site, you're to build, you know, 39 units, and they're going to serve households with exactly this income, and you're going to do this and do that, and you're going to reserve, um, you know, units for secretaries, of people who work in police departments. I mean, it, it couldn't be more prescriptive. In this one, essentially, the, it was wide open. What they said was, we would like developers and architects to form a team. And the only, what, the only requirement is that one member of that team must be based in New York City. And what we want you to do is to propose the next generation of affordable greenhousing. As part of the RFP process, you had to actually meet with the community board and get their input. But other than that, it was wide open. It, the idea was really, come to us with your most creative ideas and the winner will get a site. So you can see the site here. It's in the South Bronx. It's, you know, it's very interesting. It's an area, you know, when you talk about the Bronx is burning, an area that was decimated by um, the downturn of New York City in the 1970s and, and 1980s, you know, that was very much in this area. It's now an area that actually has seen enormous rebuilding. And the Viverde site was actually one of the few remaining sites that you know, was a large scale site and actually is an important site because it links different neighborhoods that had already had significant investment. So here is the site, it's a very funny site. Um, what you actually had was a rail line that ran up through the Bronx for freight delivery and this site was where, was, there's a rail line that runs through it and it was also where rail cars would offload. So it was, the site itself was about 20 feet below street grade it's a brownfield site, 
And essentially, it also, in, for all intents and purposes, was unbuildable from a legal point of view. Once you actually followed all the sort of setback rules and, and did what you were required to do by New York City zoning, you really couldn't build on the site. So a very, very challenging site was you know, what was being offered up in this particular competition. Um, this is just a view from the street looking down into the site. Um, I'm going to hand over to the architects now, but I just want to give uh, maybe two pieces of context. Um, one is that when we did meet with the local community, and which an HPD had done a terrific job sort of getting their input as part of the sort of information that was given to teams that wanted to respond to the RFP, what we heard loud and clear was that the community was in fact very, very concerned about health. There was a perceived um, asthma crisis going on in the South Bronx. There were all sorts of indicators showing that low-income families were, much more, were suffering from much higher health risks than non-low-income families. And so this idea, this focus on health is not something that was sort of dreamed up by the bureaucrats. It actually came very clearly from the community members themselves. And I think really became a cue for our team in trying to figure out you know, what is it that we really wanted to focus on as we began to develop our competition entry. Oh, good evening. Uh, Robert and I are, are representing Grimshaw Architects and Batner Architects, respectively, the architectural portion of the development team. And uh, before we start, I'd just say I think one of the unique strengths of our team was the four members, the two developers, Jonathan Rose Companies, Phipps Houses, the two architects, Grimshaw and Batner. We each brought our own if you will, culture or identity as architects, as developers to the project, and the resulting design and the resulting building is not, is, would not be what it is without the input of each of the four parties. So it was, for, for me, professionally, it was just a, a lot of fun, really interesting. I learned a lot, both from the developers, from our partner architects, and I, I hope the same is true for, for the other partners. It was really a collaborative effort, so it was unusual in that way, and it went beyond the, the team. I think what was, we were talking a little bit before, you know, many projects in New York, in fact, most projects in New York have to go through a tremendous hurdle of bureaucracy, regulation, many agencies that, that, that uh, have to provide approval, and a special project like this was, was really uh, treated to a positive attitude from all those agencies of, you know, how can we help you? How can we make this work? This is important to the city of New York, you know, starting with HPD and, and all the other agencies, the Department of Buildings, uh, so on and so forth. We're all very helpful in trying to figure out how to make this very challenging site work. And I think it sets a great example and it would be great if that kind of attitude could be extended to, to many more projects. Um, so, I, we won't read all the bullet points. You can read for yourself uh, if we go on to the next. Uh, okay. Um, our scheme, Robert, do you want to just talk about the, the kind of basic scheme that we had? And then we'll come back to some of the design concepts. All right. The main thing that you'll notice on the map is that there's two tones. And the project really has rental and home ownership. The northern portion, which is light yellow, is a rental. There's 150 of those units. And the lower portion is the home ownership piece. And they really do kind of share all the common amenities and everything else, but the kind of, that's the general distribution of the project. And then there are things like a community facility, an entrance area, a retail on the north, as well as a fitness center on the roof, which is everyone can access. And what you can see in this slide is that the, this is a north-south section starting at 156th Street on your left, uh, extending to the south, and we'll talk a little more about that, but the building steps down from a 20-story tower down at the low end, well, you see here four-story, but actually down to a uh, three-story three townhouse section. All the roofs are green roofs, and this is what gave the project its name, Via Verde, or the Green Way, which is both literal and figurative. And uh, this is a, a photograph that Robert uh, found, which is really, in a way, the motivating concept for the project, this green tendril. And we really pictured the building as an organic uh, design that would uh, really teach people, literally, about, about sustainability by the form of the building. Yeah, the idea of the tendril for us was really using it as an inspiration, as a kind of metaphor to kind of guide the project and make sure that 
It has a very strong kind of undeniable aspect, which is I think tendrils are very powerful because there is element that actually gropes into space and kind of finds and is seeking for things. And the building, in a way, kind of does that, rises out of the ground and spirals up. So it's kind of figuratively literal, but also I think it's kind of the future of the environment. It's the growth. It's reaching out. It's what, what is this next project going to be like? What is this doing in the future? And, and this is a more detailed diagram of how that tendril was really translated into a design of this uh, spiraling design from a 20-story tower, stepping down through a series of sections down to a central courtyard. So the building really uses this triangular site with the 20-story tower at the north end, stepping down around the central courtyard, down to a landscape uh, uh, courtyard. And as you can see here, the, the various roof areas are programmed with various types of activities and planting, starting with an amphitheater for community events, resident events at, at ground level, stepping up to a uh, a grove of trees on, on the lower roof levels, on, on the far south, uh, vegetable gardens where tenants can grow their own vegetables, and then green roofs stepping up towards the uh, highest part of the project. And the building really does step from the south to the north. If you remember from the photographs that Paul was showing with the kind of general area plan, you've got a park to the south and a playing field, and then to the north of our site, essentially, there's a 20 or 18 story building. So we're kind of ascending towards the north and responding to the existing contest, as well as being kind of passively shading, self shading, or avoiding self shading, sorry, so that we're basically stepping down towards the south. And in addition to the uh, mix of incomes and the mix of, of uh, uh, rental and ownership types, there's actually a mix of apartment types. We wanted to explore different models of housing in this project. So the tower apartments are really more conventional simplex apartments uh, on a single level uh, like you'd find in many other buildings, although with some differences. For example, every apartment in the development has two exposures to uh, um, promote cross ventilation and reduce reliance on air conditioning. Um, then we come to the mid-rise section of the project, uh, pictured here in yellow, which are all duplex apartments. Um, uh, some of them are rental, some of them are co-op apartments, so both the renters and the owners get to uh, uh, take advantage of this duplex design. And this really developed uh, from the narrowness of the site and the fact that we could not design a normal, what's called double-loaded corridor with a regular apartment on one side of a corridor and another apartment on the other side. The site was simply not deep enough to accommodate that. So that we came up with this idea of a duplex apartment where, as you'll see in the next slide, uh, the apartments interlock on alternate floors. Then the lower level, uh, the lowest level at the south end and then wrapping around the courtyard, pictured here in red, are townhouses that are actually ground level units and walk up units above and have that uh, kind of traditional townhouse feeling. An interesting aspect to this building that we kind of you see visually here is that it's as thin as possible. It's basically a ribbon that's kind of stripped down and kind of creating the most exposure for daylight and for natural ventilation. This, oh, okay, so what we're seeing here, this is a, 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 an animation of slides that gives you a sense of how the building went up. These are slides that were taken over a period of time. The building was actually a mix of construction types. The tower was a cast in place flat plate concrete, the mid-rise and low-rise sections were bearing wall, uh, masonry bearing wall, and precast concrete. As we'll talk about a little more in a moment, the exterior cladding of the building was a prefabricated rain screen envelope and really gives its, was, it was an innovative technology to use on affordable housing and had some real advantages in terms of building performance and also gives the building its distinctive uh, visual character. Uh, just a couple of plans on the ground floor uh, at the northern uh, uh, end of the site at 156th Street on your left is a, a retail outlet and a community facility which will be a community health center oper operated by Montefiore Hospital. Uh, in the middle of the block, we have the main entry, uh, although the Bronx is uh, much improved and really becoming a much more vibrant, uh, this area of the Bronx, a much more vibrant neighborhood. Security does remain a concern, and the developers early on decided they wanted one central point of entry, which is through this entry portal, and we'll show you some pictures of that. So you, one comes in, t takes 
goes for the mid-rise residents in the duplex area, go, you go immediately into a lobby, or if you live in the tower, you continued under a cover walk back to the uh, um, uh, tower lobby, or if you live in the um, uh, townhouses, you circulate through the lower courtyard to a series of exterior stairs that lead to your townhouse units. And on a typical floor, this gives you, begins to give you the idea of how the floor plans work with, the, again, the tower here in blue on your left, uh, a variety of, uh, these are early plans that, that underwent some further development, but give you a conceptual idea. Actually, the core is turned, and it's quite a bit different, but the, the concept is, it, it, it remains the same from this very early drawing. Uh, the, the tower in blue, the mid-rise uh, duplexes in the brighter yellow, and the uh, uh, townhouses in the, in the softer yellow at the right. And uh, do you want to talk about the townhouse design, Robert? Well, specifically on this slide, the duplex is actually a key element. As we said earlier, it's the kind of most narrow building footprint that you can come up with. And it does that by having a quarter every other floor and a very narrow kind of living room. So <clears throat> this is the lower floor where the corridor runs between the two units. Uh, the width of the building is about 48 feet wide or something right. like that. Uh, and then you come into your kind of living room, dining, common space, and then above it, which is to the right, you go to the bedrooms. And what ends up happening is there's a kind of an interlocking that's going on where the one floor that you come in on is half the width, but then above is the full width. So you get full cross ventilation, daylight, and you get a connection to both sides. So you get the courtyard and the street view at the same time. And you see on the right side the three-dimensional kind of diagram of how those two work together and interlock. And it creates a very interesting kind of building language from the outside, but also from inside. It's quite domestic in terms of you go upstairs to the bedroom, which people understand, and kind of works that way as well. So it's an interesting typology that's not really done commonly, but I think it worked really well for us here. And it's actually quite efficient in terms of the, the use of space. And if you go to the next slide, you'll see uh, in a model apartment what the lower level looks like. This is the living room of a typical unit, and you see they have a very spacious feeling. Uh, among many other uh, features, and we'll talk in a moment about the green features, we provide ceiling fans and all the units, once again, to reduce reliance on air conditioning and promote use of natural ventilation. Uh, the kitchen's obviously on the right. Uh, this apartment has a balcony uh, uh, with a door leading out to the balcony overlooking the courtyard. And uh, another view of the stair leading to the upper level of the duplex. Um, I, th I thought we had a picture of the upstairs, but the, nope. the, the, the bedrooms are very nice. <laughs> they're hard to photograph upstairs because yeah, it's kind of a tunnel. I mean, yeah, it's but, a bedroom with a court on but, either side of the corner. You know, the, 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 the apartments have a very nice feeling. They do. I mean, they're quite a lot of light because either way you're going to get some daylight upstairs. And uh, I, I don't know if Paul mentioned, but uh, the uh, uh, rental apartments have all been rented. Uh, and approximately 75% of the co-op apartments uh, are under contract, uh, and the rest are going fast. Um, and uh, residents will start moving in uh, next month uh, so that Elizabeth's project uh, can start. Now, I like the most about these two images. You got on the left side, you're getting the competition images, <clears throat> or shortly thereafter the competition. And then to the right is a photograph from a few, from a few months ago. <clears throat> Excuse me. And what I think that's nice is that actually the photograph of the build project looks actually better than the rendering, which sometimes is not always the case. So I think there's a lot more kind of diversity of materials and kind of play of light and shadows and colors that came together and I think are perceptible in the image on the right, which I think is something that we're quite happy with. And this is uh, looking from the south end of the uh, development on one of the lower roofs looking north through the central courtyard. And again, another view of the uh, courtyard and a sense of the texture. We really tried to get away from the, the sense of the uh, exterior of the building as a flat surface by using recesses, by using uh, a variety of materials, which we'll talk about in a moment, by introducing sunshade, which of course also have a very practical effect of uh, blocking uh, excessive solar gain in apartments, the balconies, uh, and so on, to give this, uh, a sense of visual richness to uh, uh, really make, uh, give people the feeling that they're living in a place that is, is of high quality. If I go back for a moment, I think what's interesting is just, if you look at the upper portion of the building, it is a massive building, and it is kind of a repetitive pattern. 
and it's part of his charm and certainly works well in the urban landscape, but then as a kind of local human scale, I think the ground plane, this is the street on the left and then the courtyard in the inside, the ground level is scaled very differently, much more articulated, as Bill was saying, in terms of materiality and ins and outs and kind of creating opportunities for interaction with people. And the introduction of brick with a wood pallet is also quite a nice, unique material that you don't quite see often. So another uh, uh, a couple of photographs of the interior um, uh, courtyard. And as I mentioned before, the cladding of the building was a prefabricated rain screen, uh, which, was, which was fabricated on Long Island. The panels were fabricated on Long Island, shipped to the site. And I think we have some slides coming up uh, uh, to talk about this. We used three materials, uh, a metal panel, cement board panel, and as an accent, a uh, wood panel, again, to give that sense of scale, warmth, and, and, and humanity to, to, to the uh, facades. And of course, uh, things like uh, uh, louvers, sunscreens, balconies were actually, and, and the windows themselves were integrated in the fabrication of the panels. In terms of material, the lighter color you see here is the metal. Actually, most of the building is cut in metal, which is a pretty cost-effective solution. And then it's accented by these wood. There's three tones of them that are used discreetly around windows to articulate, create a kind of domestic scale. And then these kind of horizontal bands of the fiber cement, which is a much more matte. So you get kind of shiny matte and kind of rich wood textures. And it's a very good and interesting diversified material palette. So then it's accentuated by the sun shades and the balconies and kind of grip it as three-dimensional. And the, I, the idea of the rain screen essentially is that the om, envelope of the building breathes, if you will. It's a, it's a sandwich made of uh, studs, uh, a backer board, uh, a waterproofing layer, insulation, which is outside the exterior of the building, and, and the outside material, be it the metal panel, cement board, or wood. Now, the outside material will deflect most of the uh, rain or moisture, but the joints between the individual panels within the larger panels are open so that vapor can get actually get inside the wall and then weep out, avoiding the uh, buildup of vapor pressure that tends to force water to infiltrate in more conventional types of construction. So this is a, really, in, in a way, an advanced technology that allows the building to breathe naturally, maximizes thermal performance, as well as protecting against water infiltration while having a, a, re, a, a very distinctive uh, aesthetic. Yeah, I think the rain screen allows you to use materials which are quite diverse, and you can juxtapose them however you want compositionally. There's real no limitations because it's really a, a facade treatment that's quite flat. Uh, and actually, that's kind of what we were seeing earlier on the previous image. And you see it in section here. It really is a very light element on the outside. The insulation sits in there, and the, and the membrane for the waterproofing, you're doing all the work, is actually tucked inside and protected versus a barrier wall where you're getting really trying to do all the work on the front face of the building. Here, you're layering, as Bill said, 90% of the work is done here. And then the last 10%, which is the one that always ends up failing, is the one that's critical. It's protected in there where there's really no sun that shines and actually degrades the membrane. And it kind of should, in theory, be a, a much longer lasting, lower maintenance type of facade system. Certainly, it's, it's proven to be that way in, in Europe. And it's prefabricated also for a very important reason for us, because the project schedule was quite accelerated. There wasn't a lot of precedent for using these kinds of materials. As a matter of fact, to our knowledge, it really has never been used, all those materials on one particular envelope. And the expertise, let's just say, in the industry wasn't there yet. But there are people like these prefabricators who have done this kind of work, who were familiar with these materials and who rose up to the challenge and said, yeah, we can definitely do that, and we can do it very competitively. So I can't say it was the cheaper solution per se, but it certainly was a very cost-effective solution for a very important part of the project, which is kind of critical to the success of the building. And you see here a picture of uh, one of the panels, the prefabricated panels being lifted in place and, and uh, uh, brought by, by two uh, workmen into, into place where it gets uh, uh, actually welded to supports in the structure of the uh, building. It's kind of, it's a bit dramatic, but it even gets more dramatic on some of the other panels that were hoisted on site, because this is one of the smallest panels, and it doesn't have a balcony or sunshades. You have to imagine we have some panels that were 30, 35 feet long, full story high, had balconies attached to them, and sunshades with the windows, and this is what they were hoisting up on the site and getting incredibly tight tolerances and building as building, which is, has an incredibly high uh, performance envelope. Can I go back? 
and uh, a view at the uh, fabrication, uh, which is a former aircraft hangar on Long Island. This factory is amazing. I mean, our project is just lying on the floor there, and then all the way in the back actually is where we had tested a mock-up, and the scale of this building is so massive that the mock-up itself, which was two stories, was in the back there. You can't even see it. What was interesting about actually testing this thing is that we tested it for air infiltration, which is a pretty important thing in terms of air quality, but also energy performance, and water infiltration, which is very important in terms of long-term building degradation. And it performed quite well. We actually did have three failures during the test, but none of them were the building itself. The first one was the gasket at the bottom here of the panel uh, failed, and that's not really a building condition. That's an interface between the construction on the site and the, and the panel. Uh, and that happened when they were uh, pulling in the air and sucked in the gasket, basically. They fixed that. That was no problem. Another one is they're pressurizing the interiors of this, of the, of this unit that's two stories, and the top literally popped off. Like it actually it made a very loud bang. It went pow! and depressurize, and the, oh, we had to stop and we had to start again. And then the other failure, which was something that nagged at us, was we have, we have these trickle vents, and I don't know if you can see or if I can point with this, but the building has these very small ventilators at, each, at windows in the units called trickle vents, and those were not meant to be tested as part of the assembly because they're not a normal piece of what gets tested. And most of the test, it was fine, but when you pressurize it and you're pulling water in, basically a little straw, imagine that little gap, which is a quarter by three inches on the building, really was like a straw. And any water that was nearby, it was pulling it in. And it was kind of just leaking a little bit, though. I mean, it's not like it was leaking everywhere. And we had two trickle vents. One was fine, one was leaking. So that was fine in terms of, in real life, you're never going to get those. If you get a hurricane and water is coming in a little bit at the window, I think people are going to be saying, OK, that's OK. But during most of the testing and one of the vents, actually, nothing leaked. So it was fine. So really, the building performed quite well in a very, very, very tight building. And again, a, a, a kind of dramatic picture of the uh, assembled envelope. Um, so one of the aims, uh, the, the project, I think there's a few slides here about some of the sustainable elements. And the project includes uh, photovoltaics, which produce a portion of the building's electricity, rainwater harvesting to collect stormwater to uh, uh, provide irrigation to the green roofs and other landscaping, and a variety of other uh, sustainable techniques. But we also were very interested in promoting healthy living. So we've got the roof gardens to promote uh, tenants growing vegetables and learning more about uh, healthy eating. Uh, a lot of uh, uh, recreation areas, both indoor in the in the fitness center as well as outdoor. And very interestingly, we worked with the New York City Department of Health in uh, the use of their new active design guidelines uh, to promote physical activity. So the stairs in this project, which are serve a code purpose for fire safety, are designed to encourage people to use them in that they're very visible. When you walk into a lobby, the stair entrance is right next to the elevators. Once you're in the stair, there are windows in the stairs, so there's always natural light. There's actually signage that alerts tenants that using the stairs is healthy and, you know, you use the stairs, not electricity kind of thing, or, you know, uh, go up a flight of stairs and burn X number of calories. So again, it's a kind of prompt to get people to try to change behavior. It'll be fascinating. I feel a little bit under pressure now to see how it turns out. No, but seri no, scrutiny. No, no, seriously, it'll be very interesting to see how from, you know, a more theoretical design point of view, uh, techniques like this actually play out in real life, and I, you know, really applaud this effort and think it'll be really interesting in, in, in informing how architects design buildings in the future about seeing what works and maybe what doesn't work. And again, some of the other uh, uh, um, uh, techniques we mentioned to uh, promote uh, uh, energy efficiency and, and resource conservation, as, as one of the earlier slides mentioned, the building is uh, aiming and on track to achieve uh, LEED Gold certification, which is a, a, a pretty good achievement for an affordable housing project given the types of constrained budgets. We're also participating in the NYSERDA multifamily performance uh, program and the Enterprise Green Communities uh, Initiative. So there's a variety of sustainable programs that the project is, is uh, participating in. And as I mentioned, we do have a number of uh, technologies uh, such as uh, photovoltaics, uh, rainwater harvesting, and of course the green roofs 
uh, to uh, uh, enhance the environment of the project. I mean, there really was three prongs that you just saw that we kind of approached the project in terms of creating sustainability. The first one is really kind of social sustainability, which is the healthy and environmental kind of connection to the outdoors, kind of biophilia and those kinds of ideas comes into play. The other one was just energy efficiency and kind of the more classic definition of sustainability. And then the last aspect is more about the kind of higher technology demonstrative, you know, kind of leading the charge forward towards a, the kind of long-term sustainability. And to that effect, actually, one of the interesting things, the project, obviously, Via Verde and the landscape is the key part of the project, but there is a component to it that we find kind of works as in tandem. And it's not a primary element, but it's pretty important in terms of the, <clears throat> the roofs that ascend. The building does step, as I mentioned previously, from the north to the south. You've got these perfect, unshaded, south-facing walls that you can use photovoltaics on, as well as conditions that are running horizontally. With this take advantage of not only the south faces, but also the horizontal. You see them at the top on the roof. We have as many conditions as possible. We're also doing photovoltaics in the horizontal plane. And we're getting about 25 to 3% of the overall energy of the building, which translates to about 4 or 5% of electricity, which is not a tremendous, but it's actually a large building and consumes a fair amount of energy for all different services. So it's pretty ambitious for a building of affordable yeah. housing. So. Um, and there you see the uh, uh, photovoltaics on the south-facing facades. And they're really part of the composition of the material palettes as well. You know, there's a kind of orientation that's expressed through these darker uh, material treatments that are in the background in terms of corrugated metal, but also in the PVs themselves are kind of black surfaces. So there's a kind of accentuation of that piece of the building versus the vertical facades of the sides and the interior. Uh, and again, the uh, stair sign that I, I mentioned earlier. Um, and windows in the stairs. Uh, and again, in uh, uh, promoting the idea of physical activity, walking the roofs. This is the amphitheater under construction, some of the roof areas. Uh, and I think that's our last slide, uh, an overview of the project. Uh, 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 several months ago. And uh, a great design is great, but it's nothing without financing. <laughs> Probably the most important challenge no. of uh, affordable housing. So, Michael? Thanks. First of all, I'm sure everyone can agree that I have by far the best slide, right? <laughs> so not only with, with the best slide, but being stuck last and following the, uh, the really fun part of the project, which is, which is its design, but I will say, for, uh, for the bean counters like me, this does have a, sort of an equal, what was the phrase earlier, a library of best practices, I think, uh, regarding the architecture. Well, it's sort of a library of, of housing resources or at least a alphabet soup of acronyms. So if you look at this list, this is just the rental. This is how we financed it. There are eight different line items there. Uh, when it came time to do the financing for the project, I sat for three consecutive hours doing nothing but signing documents. It's a pretty long sit when all you're doing is signing Michael Wadman, Michael Wadman, etc. So, and uh, it gives you an idea of just how much was involved. And to build a building of this uh, kind of unusual nature, the fact that the, the city of New York backed us throughout and was willing to put in uh, really the bulk of these resources was really the only thing that, that allowed us to build the project. And if you think about the timeline, I think as you heard earlier, this started five, six years ago. It was designed at the height of uh, economic exuberance and real estate boom. And the city was trying to be aspirational in terms of what kinds of income levels it could do and what kinds of projects it could build. And in, uh, as you know, in fall of 2008, all that changed. This project was just about to move into its home stretch into figuring out how to actually get it closed and built. And the city throughout that uh, you know, quite wrenching phase uh, maintained its support and, and not only that supported us in revising a lot of what we had, uh, well not a lot, but certain constraints that the economy had placed on us. There was slightly higher incomes before that you know, involved different resources. Those incomes were no longer available in the recession, and so the city had to counter by increasing other forms of resources. 
What you see here is really two different city agencies, HTC and HBD, two different kinds of HBD money. Uh, the Federal Home Loan Bank of New York is one of the federal banking regulatory agencies. NYSERDA was mentioned earlier as the Energy Research uh, Authority. Tax credit equity, uh, a bunch of our own money, and deferring the bulk of our profit. And that's basically how this rental side um, got produced. And the co-op, I don't actually know how to use this. What do I do to click to the next slide? Space bar. Uh, co-op is actually one line item more complicated. It's definitely a personal record. There are nine different mortgages on this property. And uh, I'm pretty sure no one has hit 10. I don't think you can do two jitters, but it's possible. Uh, and on this side, it was even more so, because as you recall, one of the main things that caused the recession was, uh, was the foreclosure crisis and the overlending in the mortgage market. So the home ownership side of the project was essentially impossible to finance on any normal project as soon as the foreclosure crisis hit. Um, and the banks who uh, were providing the construction financing um, were only willing to, they basically cut our sales prices as, as they assumed we would get by about 20%. And so without that money, there really, there really wouldn't have been a project. And uh, thankfully, there's this bridge financing line item down there you see. Uh, thankfully, we were able to identify uh, a socially conscious uh, investor. It's basically a foundation affiliated with a mutual fund company that was willing to lend us that $3 million at those higher prices that we had hoped to get and essentially leave it to us to actually sell them at that price and be able to pay them back and, uh, and live happily ever after. On this side, you see the state as well. The New York State Affordable Housing Corp dived in. Um, as well as that bridge financing, as well as all the other sources that you saw on the slide before. So um, I guess I'd just say, you know, in addition to, to such a complicated design, it was an extremely complicated financing process. Um, and um, the other last thing I would say is that al although what you saw was pretty special compared to the average affordable housing project in terms, of, in terms of design and features. It really didn't end up being uh, incredibly much more expensive than, than a standard project. I mean, I think there were some really good lessons in being willing to spend a little bit to get a lot. Um, and my boss at Phipps always says, it's, it's the least expensive, expensive building you'll ever see. And I think that remains true. So I think we wanted to move on to questions for the most part, because I know we've been talking for a while. So thank you very much. Most of you have extensive, is an understatement, but extensive uh, experience in affordable housing, public housing. Um, what do you think clicked in this project? I mean, you mentioned that somehow uh, the rules were a little looser, or you know, what do you think made it different? Because you do speak of it as very different from your other projects. So I'm curious, like, what 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 were the conditions? Um, there, there's a story I always tell about the very beginning of the project, which is that at one of our very first design meetings for the project, we actually asked the two architects to not talk for their first submission, and each of them were to come to the first meeting with a diagram of how they envisioned the building would look. And what was amazing for me was that they essentially brought the same diagram. Um, and to me, that was sort of a you know, sort of really magic moment. And I guess the other thing I would say about the building is that really within sort of the first couple of weeks of beginning to develop the building, um, you know, really the, you know, sort of the diagram was established of what became the building. Some of these sketches that were shown of the green roofs, the initial form of the building, emerged almost, it felt like almost instantaneously. So there was sort of a, a sort of synergy that went on within the team that seemed to make it, you know, just really flow naturally. You know, we've worked on a lot of RFPs, a lot of different projects, and there was something sort of um, remarkably collaborative about the vision. And I, I think that one thing was that both architects did take their cue from the site, 
I think everyone was really struck by the open, um, the area, the, play, well, the playing fields to the south of the site that we knew would be eternally open and would allow light to fall on the site from the south. But that to me was a very sort of powerful element about how the team worked together. I would just add, uh, as I was saying before, I think there was a real willingness on the part of the public agencies mm -hmm. from HPD to the buildings department to city planning. It was a very complex project that involved some, some very complex zoning issues which we didn't have time to, to talk about tonight. And, you know, the agencies, this project was very high profile, it was a high priority of the uh, of HPD and of the administration and there was a real effort to let's let's see how we can make this work rather than what rule are you breaking now and uh, it was actually quite refreshing to, to work in that kind of environment yeah I think it was really a, an issue of how far do we need to push the envelope and which one of those pieces of the envelope is it okay to push and you know what do you get out of it so there really was a kind of iterative process that we had which was quite uh, I think helpful for everyone involved. I mean, maybe one last thing to point out is that because the, the architects were such a, a defined member of the team from the beginning, that it was not quite the same as a normal architect and client relationship. And I'm sure the architects felt that it was a little bit different. Mm -hmm. And I think led to being able to uh, accept design a little higher in the scheme than we might have otherwise and, and produce something that's that's a little bit different. I actually thought there was an article in the New York Times last fall, and the writer, I think, had the point that he made that I thought was a really good one, is that you, you can't do this project for all of your projects. It's too expensive. It's too different. You know, the, you can't, it doesn't make sense. Mm. But to have one of them here and there while you're doing a bunch of really nice but less unusual buildings. I mean, my, my other projects that several of these people have worked on before no, are very nice. They're nicer than a lot of market rate housing, but they're not as nice as this. Mm -hmm. And we have whole neighborhoods of that, and with, with a special moment here and there, it does really have value. Um, I think that's what this project really brings to its you know, environment up there. It's, it's really interesting uh, to me when I visited. It, it's like you, um, it's all about the section, really, and, and this idea of public health is intertwined with this idea of section. So you take steps, the fitness center's at the top, you have this terracing, you vary the scale. And I was wondering, um, this is, is, the, is the possibility of this design also a result of maybe less density? Or how does it compare in terms of density? Because it really feels there's a sense of openness, right? It's not like a maxed out site where you're trying to carve. So I wonder. This is, this is pretty a pretty yeah, dense yeah. project. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's an acre it's an acre and a half site. We have 222 units. So what does that work out to? Like 150 units per acre. I'd say that's pretty dense. Yeah, yeah. And that's and, pretty and urban. I mean, because it looks as though it's well, not dense. So it's I, interesting well, for me by to. Well, by, by maybe counterintuitively going to a high rise solution. Um, we enable, and, and by keeping the building, as Robert mentioned, keeping the building as thin as possible, even though the site is awkward and narrow, et cetera, et cetera, we were able to maximize the outdoor space. And I think that really makes a huge difference uh, in the design. Kind of goes to support uh, kind of an urban planning principle that most people in the states don't really accept, which is what density can actually do for you. Mm -hmm. By having a 20-story tower, the density on the entire project could be varied so tremendously. I mean, we have you know these plateaus after plateau, and that's simply not possible without the 20-unit tower to carry the bulk of the affordable housing. And it allows you to leave open space, and it allows you to make a courtyard, and it allows you to do something with all this variety. That's I think true. That's, that's kind of a, a nice element. Of it. And I will say that actually it was a defining characteristic of our competition entry. Um, you know, there were something like 37 entries from around the world that were narrowed down to five finalists. The five finalists, each team was featured in an exhibit that was actually held at the Architecture Center. And of the five finalists, ours was the densest scheme. I mean, we had conversations about that and sort of decided to take a chance of proposing a scheme that was probably denser than what we thought people had envisioned for the site. In terms of density, what's interesting is Paul mentioned that in the beginning that the scheme, the concept, the parti came, you know, came about pretty quickly, which it did intuitively, but we still studied kind of maxing it out some more or doing a more traditional you know, 10 or 12 story across the site, which is what a lot of buildings do because it's very cost effective. 
And it, so it, what I'm saying, I guess, is that it, density is, is there, but it doesn't really feel as overwhelming as you might in other places because of the variety of the tower on the north and the lower portions that are like three stories on the south. But I think more importantly is that it actually it is a, that thin ribbon that wraps onto itself. So from some viewpoints, if you're coming in from the north, looking at it, it's imposing and it's very high density. I mean, it, does, it almost seems out of scale. If you're coming from the south, looking at it rising, it seems quite diminutive and it's kind of interesting to kind of rise up. And what's more importantly though, I mean, those are just how it feels in the context in terms of urbanism, but from the building itself, when you're at the sidewalk or in the courtyard or in the building, it feels right and it does break itself down into scales. I think that's kind of what you're responding to is when you're inhabiting the building, it doesn't feel overbearing and incredibly high density and, and alienating. And I was gonna add, interestingly, I don't think we maybe even fully realized this at first, but one of the things that struck me since the building was built is that it's actually in an odd way contextual. And you know, I wouldn't think you'd say that about a 20-story tower in what's largely a kind of low to mid-rise section of the Bronx, but our immediate neighbor to the east is a New York City Housing Authority building that's an 18-story tower. And oddly, I think our building, Via Verde, sort of completes that building as a composition. They're very different, they look very different, they have a very different feel, but somehow as, as, as you walk by or go by on the two or five train which passes to the south of the site and, and look out and see the two projects together, there, there's, I think it really builds a sense of context. I think one last point, which actually is not so much the issue of density, but I think it has to do with kind of proper urbanism, is that the building does maintain the street edge and I think that's very important as a solution. So it kind of sets the tone of what typical higher density is considered to be good. It's not because they're tall buildings that are good necessarily. It's really because they fill their lot, they create a defined private public realm, they create amenities at street, which is what the building actually does do, which a lot of housing projects, whether they be higher or lower density, maybe don't quite do or have not in the past, but they're more aware and it's more important now and obviously we're sensitive to that. I think the other aspect is, um, you know, there's tremendous articulation, differentiation, variety, diversity. I mean, it's, 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 uh, do you find that this is a, a result of your collaboration? I mean, you, you have, there's, there is definitely a kind of almost European sensibility or um, then there's, of course, the kind of New York brick at the bottom and then there's, um, and, and probably your kind of collective experience and, uh, I mean, is that somehow, uh, a result a little bit of the kind of group coming together with? I think so. I mean, I think yeah. that uh, there is a bit of a sensibility of something that you might be more familiar with in Europe, but it's not because it's not here as well. There are some projects in Manhattan that are going up that use some of these technologies. Mm -hmm. It's really more looking at the more traditional or time-tested solutions and then the kind of more cutting and balancing those two out. And it's this constant game of like, well, what is the higher technology solution? What is the more lower cost technology or lower technology? And then how do you work the two together? And the building kind of keeps playing that game always. And certain materials are pretty high end, some are pretty low base, you know, low key. The structure is very, you know, mm -hmm. low key, but then the facade is a little bit more of a premium. And I think that, yeah, there was definitely a lot of collaboration in terms of how we would, could develop these materials. I mean, there's a lot of debate in the first parts of the project where the lower level had some rain screen materials and then ended up coming back down to brick, which is really where it should be because it kind of feels okay and, or feels good in terms of texture. But from our point of view, and sometimes during the design, when you're kind of up in the concepts or not necessarily thinking about the final solution, it just seems better to bring the rain screen all the way down and demonstrate it and find the right product. But there's definitely was a learning experience and a kind of iterative process between all the different members. A lot of the um, kind of success for me was the integration of architecture and landscape, right? It's very strongly uh, integrated. Um, and landscape, even more than building, suggests maintenance. And, and we know that, uh, in a way, a lot of the failures of kind of old housing types is a failure of the ground. Um, but I know that the, the structure is set up so that the, the, the development will be maintained over time. Can you talk a little bit more about your involvement? Yeah, well, Fifth, Fifth Houses is the, has a large property management company as, as part of its uh, uh, range of businesses, and I think um, you know they they will they will bring um, you know some skill to bear on that. But we've also set them up by spending some money in the way this has been designed. I mean, it's got drip irrigation, all the 
stuff even up on the roofs does. Mm -hmm. You're not talking about having a porter walk around with a watering can or something like that. And I think you really couldn't do it otherwise because um, e even in a very concerned owner management kind of kind of setup, you don't you don't have money to do a lot of labor intensive stuff. And w one other thing we're doing, which um, which Jonathan Rose Companies has really led the the charge on, is bringing uh, a nonprofit group, Grow NYC, who runs the farmers markets in New York. They're doing two years of training, uh, the first two years of operations. Um, some of the beds we didn't talk too much, but the ones in the foreground of that picture there are uh, our gardening plots for residents. There's also a fruit tree orchard and a um, evergreen tree or a Christmas tree, if you wanted to be less politically correct. Um, and particularly for the, the resident plots, but for some of those other things as well, getting residents involved in maintaining them will actually save us money, but will be a huge community building and ownership thing. I mean, especially with 150 rental units, low income rental units, doing what we can to inspire a sense of ownership around the project um, will help us on all those fronts. And a lot of this stuff is not particularly high intensity. You know, the green roofs, many of them are kind of low intensity. You know, it's grass and seed. It's mostly for the heat island effect, not so much for, you know, elaborate lush scenery. Yeah, we should, we should also give credit yeah. to our landscape yeah. architect. We talked about this exactly. four member <laughs> team. There really was an integral fifth member who was involved from the very beginning in the competition, Lee Weintraub, one of New York's great landscape architects. And he and his firm really did a terrific and very thoughtful job in designing the uh, landscape elements with us. Yeah, I think the ongoing maintenance of this project was always a critical aspect that we're always reminded and debating and how far can you go. I mean, it was obviously a bit of a concern and it still is now. I mean, you know, it's a bit pushing the boundary on that one. Kidding creating a green roof that everyone can access on an affordable housing project is pretty unprecedented, certainly in this scale. And so I think time will tell. But I think we're pretty sensitive in terms of, as Michael just said, you know, planting species that will just take care of themselves, like sedums, which really, once they're established and it doesn't take too long, they should pretty much take care of themselves, especially because we're collecting rainwater and then we're doing a drip irrigation back on the underside. So we're pretty confident that some of the landscape technologies are pretty time tested. I think some of the more interesting ones to, to remain to be seen are the common, you know, garden plots. I mean, how successful? I mean, assuming that everyone's going to love the project for that and everyone will be growing vegetables, and, but maybe they won't. Oh, no, actually, but I can talk to that for a minute. So, so my new favorite group is this group that we brought in called Grow NYC. Um, and essentially, they're a not for profit group that runs both farmers markets and they help organize community gardens. And they're terrific. I'm, I'm really impressed by them. And their goal, I mean, what we've charged them with is they're supposed to put themselves out of business in two years. So the idea is that they're, they're really meant to come in and you know, work with the tenants and really have the tenants take on and sort of own the gardens. And so, for instance, one thing we've done is we're working with them. They will do the first plantings. The first plantings are actually going in right now because one of the things they've said is that people will get more excited about gardens that they see producing versus just you know plots of lands that missed their growing season this year and you try to get them excited for next year. So the idea is they've actually, they're going to be starting the planting, but then as people move in starting in April and through the summer, you know they'll actually be able to benefit from the produce that's being generated and get them excited for next season. The other thing I find fascinating is that what they've, I guess the new model for community gardens, you don't give you know, one family a four by four plot and then somebody else next door a four by four plot. It's much more sort of you know, a socialist collective model where um, you know, everybody actually contributes. They vote, they work together to decide what's gonna be planted and then they actually work together and you actually contribute time to working in the gardens, and then based on sort of your time contribution, you then benefit from the produce that's being generated. So it's really trying to have the collective work together to create the best garden collectively for everyone versus you know growing your little plot and then stealing the tomatoes from your neighbors next door. So I mean, it's, I'm really happy to have them on board because they've actually been doing this for a number of years and seem to really know what they're talking about in terms of using the gardens you know, to really maximize both their health, health potential and also their sort of social benefit in terms of creating community. Actually, one thing that may, may not have been clear because we didn't really dwell too much on the landscape in some ways is that to keep in check the maintenance potential burden or concerns on this project, only about the one third of the project is accessible and the rest of them are really just off limit and you know, again, they're planted with species that are just gonna be fine on their own. So kind of reduce the maintenance burden and also just making sure that people aren't creating trouble all over the place. I mean, although it has a very green tapestry all over the place, it really has the lower one-third of the project that's accessible. Um, 
Is the mix uh, between sales and rental typical? And what do you imagine the relationship between both inhabitants and what do you imagine the, the, the kind of relationship of Via Verde to the neighborhood? I know the Wall Street Journal article was a little bit, um, you know, the price point of the apartments is higher. You know, it's a kind of usual questioning of, you know, does it lead to gentrification? Is there anything we can do about that? I mean, how, how do we, what is your <clears throat> feeling about um, the kind of future of the project in the neighborhood as well as the future between the owners and the renters? Yeah, sure. I mean, the easiest part of the question is it's it's pretty unusual to, to do this particular mix. I mean, having a two-third uh, very rent-restricted low-income rental with a third at a much more moderate or middle-income level all coexisting is definitely uh, not a standard model. And I think um, there's, there's plenty of other types of mixed-income housing. I mean, Paul has a project that's 50% market with some middle and some low. The city does sponsor projects like that but not typically with the mixed forms of ownership. And I think, um, you know, so far, there have definitely been potential buyers who have expressed concern about the issue. You know, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be accurate to say that that doesn't exist. You know, people wonder what the tenancy is gonna be like. They wonder if they're, you know, the fact that they're twice as many of the rental units. But, um, but you know, we've sold 50 of the 70 in a few months, and I'm sure we're gonna sell the rest too. So I think more than enough people are comfortable with what the product is and, wh and what they're seeing uh, to proceed. Um, in terms of, uh, you know, I, the neighborhood kind of community board and local leaders, I don't think are concerned about gentrification per se. I think it's actually kind of the opposite. They've, they've had a lot of low-income housing built in that area, and that's, and that's what the area needed. But uh, especially during the, the more boom years that I mentioned in, earlier, the city and the neighborhood was really looking to bring in people at slightly higher level, 80% of median income, 100%, 120%, not vastly different really, but a lot of those people get priced completely out of affordable housing traditionally, and I think that was really what they were looking for. And the fact that we still have a good chunk of, of a different income level, and also an ownership level. There's, there's not a lot of new, there is some ownership housing that the city has sponsored in this neighborhood, but most of it was a little while ago because they've been emphasizing higher density rental housing. So I, th I think the neighborhood's pretty excited. And I was just going to say, you know, the the home ownership is still affordable home ownership, and you know we have done buildings, and there are loads of buildings in New York City where you have you know full market rate combined with affordable housing, and it's fine. In, in our current building, which um, Michael referred to, um, where we have actually 50% market rate, 30% middle income, 20% affordable. Um, you know, they're all using the same fitness center that, you know, and it's just fine. You know, so I, I think that this is an idea that people worry much more about than the reality plays out to be. I just wanted to add from a policy perspective, I mean, if there's one thing that we've sort of learned from the heritage of U.S. housing policy, it's that concentrated poverty is incredibly detrimental to individuals, the life chances across generations to whole neighborhoods. Um, I mean, this is the whole point of Hope 6 and all these other kinds of policies that are, and, and frankly, vouchers, the increased use of vouchers is to try to actually not concentrate and, if possible, to actually create sort of more equitable distribution. Um, and so when we're talking about a place like the South Bronx, where it's a 42% poverty rate, um, affordable housing actually plays a very unique role in that it is very important that we actually insert ourselves and try to very consciously help to create a more a broader socioeconomic diversity. Mm -hmm. um, the, the median income in the South Bronx right now is about $22,000. Mm -hmm. um, so from that perspective, even the very low income rental units actually are much higher than the median. Um, but the whole point is to be able to actually give people opportunities for different forms of housing and to be able to create communities and actually one of the things we're really excited to be studying in Villa Verde is not only the interaction among residents within the complex itself, across homeowner, renter, and within each, but also the interaction within the broader neighborhood, and particularly that tower, that NYCHA tower right next door, that actually there are benefits that may spill over to those public housing residents that we're really hoping to be able to capture. Right. So. so. Why not more? Can we get more no. via Verdes? <laughs> do we need to just have one? Um, no, but I mean, you know, do you see this as a, can this become a new model or, you know, is it, is it, is the hope that it starts to kind of shift 
you know, I, it was interesting even at the scale of the of the living room, you know, the fact that, for example, the kitchen was open onto the living room, there was a little desk, you know, so so it's a new idea of lifestyle that maybe doesn't require closed oh. living, you know, all these things. Well, I, you know, one of the, it's, it's interesting that you mentioned that because uh, one of the aims of the competition was that whatever would be developed would be replicable. Mm -hmm. And frankly, this building is not replicable. Mm -hmm. It's a unique building on a very unusual site and it benefited from a lot of high-level focus. Uh, it was the competition started uh, when Sean Donovan, who's now the uh, uh, Secretary of the U.S. Secretary of HUD, was the commissioner at HPD, and there was there was a lot of political will. It came out of a certain time and place. And although uh, I think uh, I can't remember if it's Michael said that. Uh, 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 Adam Weinstein at Phipps, the, the president of Phipps, said this is the what was he said the least expensive least expensive, expensive building. Yeah. I mean, it was, it's not an extravagant building in terms of, you know, say, uh, uh, market rate housing in Manhattan. It's it's a bargain in terms of construction costs. But it is a notch more expensive than the standard affordable housing project. And that notch does make a difference. And what I think is replicable about this project, and why not more, is many of the elements. There may be some of the financing techniques that were used. But from a design point of view, things from like the home office desk, or we call it the homework desk in the apartment, we've now used on a number of other projects. And many of the other elements of thinking about the relationship between indoors and outdoors, and uh, the use of even something as simple as the use of ceiling fans, all of which, or, or, or light and stairways, um, many elements like that I think are fairly easily translatable to other projects. And I think many architects and developers are starting to adopt uh, uh, many, of, many of these elements. I think there's actually three separate buildings. They're all glued together in this project. And each one of those three, I think, is somewhat replicable, whether it's the duplexes, the townhouses, mm -hmm. or the tower. But they'll never really likely come in together as one project like this, because it's a pretty unique site for that. <coughs> I think the effect, probably speaking for Phipps's perspective at least, the effect is more in increasing the baseline for other projects than it is in replication per se. I mean, Phipps in 2006 was not really a leader in the sustainable area. I mean, I think it's pretty safe to say, although I didn't work there then, so maybe I'm throwing them under the bus. But um, over that time, we're, we're, we've become quite up to date. And also over that time, the industry has shifted dramatically. I mean, in 2006, this was really just starting to penetrate affordable housing. And now, even the stuff we do on our most ordinary buildings is very different than where we were five years. I mean, Bill's worked with FIPS for 10 years, probably, or more even. And I'm sure you've seen you know, that change over time. And I think that's the main thing that, that can be passed on, is all of a sudden you're operating at this level instead of that level. You still might not be at this level, but it, but it all accumulates over time. And I right. think that's something that we're, we're proud to have learned from this project and to be applying you know, moving forward. When I was going to say, it's, you gave the tiniest example, but that was actually a real life example. Um, HPD um, was not used to doing open kitchens. And so when we first presented the floor plans, they said, well, these are all fine, but you know, we don't do open kitchens. We, we really think that people want to have their enclosed kitchens. And we had to fight this whole battle to say, no, you know, really, this is the trend. People want to live this way. It's, you know, for it actually, you get sort of double use of the space. It makes the floor, you know, it's all going to lay out so much better. And it was a real battle. We were back and forth with the design, the people who review design of HPD and finally got them to sort of agree to going with the open kitchens. And I, from my own experience working with HPD, you know, that, that's, once we fought that battle, it's done. If I were to go into HPD now with a project with an open kitchen, the people who review that would say, fine, you know, we understand that. So I do feel as though there are a lot, you know, there are a hundred little moments in this project that have now won adherence, you know, sort of within the city that I think you could now, you know, that they could fertilize other projects. Mm -hmm. um, let me just add this too, that, I mean, this is part of, I think, why we've had such great luck bringing in um, partners onto our project and having funding to support researching this is not only to be able to disaggregate which components really have the greatest impact and hopefully replicate those in other um, m more practicable ways. Um, but the other part of this is also, um, you know, we're, we're increasingly doing more with less. And we're really, I think all of us recognize that we're hitting a point where we're going to have to start doing less with less, <laughs> all right, unless something really changes. 
Um, you know, I look at this really, truly remarkable combination of funding that you guys cobble together, um, which is amazing, um, but very unusual. And a lot of those items are just being slashed across the board in terms of budgets. And, and literally, I think this project could not be done even with that political will right now, mm -hmm. um, which is the reality. But part of what we're trying to do is actually think outside of the box to show the, the cost benefit of exactly these kinds of developments, right? That a dollar spent here or $99 million spent here, right, can over the course of 10, 20, 50 years actually produce really social benefits and, and, and real cost reductions in other kinds of programming, whether it's Medicaid and Medicare, whether it's absences from school, whether it's all of these other kinds of things. And I think, um, helping to establish support and continued support for any kind of public programming requires that kind of showing that it really can be cost effective or at least socially effective um, in a cost reasonable way. So. Um, I know some of you. My name is Karen Kuby, and um, this is a really exciting um, presentation for me to see because I was a student here, but before that I was um, lucky to be involved in New Housing New York as the uh, co-chair of the committee that, that produced that competition. And I, I'm grateful especially to Paul to, for talking about that. I wanted to add a couple of things. One is, one thing I think is really important is to say that the competition was actually originally conceived of by an independent committee of architects and developers. and of course, the HPD support and the AI support were invaluable, um, but I think the fact that the competition was sort of a dream for developers and architects is because it was produced by those same people. Um, and I think in addition to the fact that it was wide open to some degree, I think it's also important to po point out that there were very specific ideas that were quantified, especially in terms of um, uh, the, there was an independent jury and, and the jury used very specific criteria to judge the projects, and those criteria were disseminated to the people who um, entered. One thing is design was weighted 30%, um, and, and sustainability was also very high, and you can just sort of read those, it feels like you can just read those percentages in the um, final design. Um, and one other thing was, um, especially you know, having some young people among the committee being very excited about about getting teams in. So also that was something that was written in. So it's exciting to see all those things sort of um, come forward. And I think also the project is really amazing. And I think one thing that needs to be highlighted even more than you talked about is, is this, this very um, simple thing of the narrow building. Um, because having more in affordable housing, it's like the 60-foot building is sort of unquestioned. So the 47.6 or whatever it is, is actually produces really exciting stuff. And I've heard, I don't know, maybe you can talk about it a little bit more, but I've heard that sort of the city is actually really excited about um, narrower buildings. And that alone, I think, is really cool. Um, and I will get to a question in a second. Um, uh, also, I think, you know, hearing uh, Elizabeth and Michael, I think, together producing a really um, strong argument for um, public support of housing, it makes me also think of a, a quote that says, you know, beyond um, quantifying, it's too bad that it's not enough just to say this is the right thing to do. Um, so my question is, um, though this project was about 5% more expensive, as I understand, than a normal affordable housing project, I know that y you guys, like every other design development team, had to go through some value engineering. Um, so I'm wondering if you can talk about any um, elements that you had hoped to be part of the design that ultimately weren't part of it that you hope can be experiments in future projects you work on? I just want to start by saying, I, I, I will say this to my grave, is that the reason the building was more expensive really did not have to do with it being green. It really, I mean, it, there was a small amount of that, but really a great deal of the cost had to do with the fact that it was a brownfield site, that essentially the soil that we were building on could not have been crappier. I mean, very, very, very expensive foundation systems. And also that we were very much at the city's bidding, trying to make absolutely as dense a project as you could. There haven't been many affordable housing towers built in the last you know, 20, 30 years. It's a very unique project in that it uses high-rise construction associated with affordable housing. So the additional cost is not, be, I mean, yes, 
green roofs cost money, but really the uptick was driven heavily by the site itself, the narrowness of the site, the brownfield conditions, the soil conditions, and also the density of, that was going on the site. So. Oh, and as far as things that were lost, there are some tragic balconies that we really <laughs> wanted. I don't think anyone even wants to admit that anything was lost. <laughs> no, but there were, the original design had a lot more balconies, and we lost some of these balconies. I mean, there were still, there's still plenty of balconies in the end product, but in particular on the tower, there were many, many more balconies that we, we yeah. lost I mean, along the way. I mean, that is really the element, I think, that stands out that dropped from the competition, yeah. is that every unit had a balcony. It was a certain idea about how we wanted to approach that, and at this point, only maybe a quarter of the units ended up with balconies. I think that was one of the major ones, and, and a lot of the other was really more adjustments in uh, materials. So, for example, on the facade, uh, originally we had a lot more of the uh, cement board and wood panels, and we changed the balance to, as Robert mentioned, primarily metal panels, which are less expensive, and began to use the wood just more as an accent. Um, similarly, in the landscape, some of the paving materials uh, were adjusted to, to be a little less expensive. And, you know, I have to give some credit, too, to our contractor, Latier Construction, who really did a great job in uh, uh, building the project but uh, you know, also was creative in trying to keep the cost down and understood that uh, you know, this was an unusual project and, and, and really worked with us in that regard. I mean, it, it doesn't really sound credible necessarily if we say it, but take my word for it if you can. I mean, it, there wasn't really anything lost along the way. I mean, I think all the key critical pieces that made the project what it is are still there. And in some ways, some parts got better and some parts that weren't necessarily great fell to the wayside. And there are moments, of course, when you're in the middle of designing this thing where it feels like the end of the world. It's like, oh my God, you gotta get rid of the balconies. I fought that one till the end. And then it, you're like, who cares? It doesn't matter. It's, it wasn't such a big deal in hindsight and it's okay. And you know, you look on the bright side and there's other issues that you focus on instead and that's what we did. And it was just part of the evolution of the project. Well, do you want to start? Or I, and from my point of view, there were, there were a couple of advantages. And we did look at uh, uh, field construction of the panels as opposed to prefabrication. We opted for prefabrication really for, I would say, two reasons. One, it, there, there wasn't a cost savings um, in, in, in the prefabrication, or at least not a significant one. But one was speed of erection, of getting the building enclosed quickly. And the second was quality control, that the panels were fabricated, the windows were integrated, uh, the, the sunscreens, the balconies were all integrated in a controlled environment that was protected from the weather, which ensured uh, a certain degree uh, of quality. And then, if, as I mentioned, the building then was able to be enclosed relatively quickly. I think the prefabrication was something that is one of those uh, ideas of the competition that was a nice idea. You know, we wanted to do more than just the facade. And the fact that we ended up doing prefabricated facade was really driven by the right answer. You know, we ended up, as Bill just said, we looked at the more traditional way of doing the construction versus prefabrication. There was a while where it looked like it wasn't going to happen. It, of course, that made us a little bit sad on our side who were pushing for it. But at the same time, we just felt like, well, the right solution will come. And it ended up coming to those moments where we looked at both options, the more traditional versus prefab. And as Bill said, it wasn't necessarily cheaper, but it was, um, it was cost effective. It was the same kind of price. But more importantly, the people who were doing it had kind of the track record. And there was a comfort in actually them being able to achieve it on time, on budget, on the schedule. And the schedule was really the critical thing, as Bill said. I mean, uh, you know, doing a prefabricated facade, you can zip up this building. We had a couple of little problems, as normally you do on any project in terms of scheduling. But if everything goes well, I mean, it's incredible how fast the building envelope can be closed up. And even this one, even, you know, it was very fast compared to any other way to do it. So that had a lot of benefits to it. And then the last thing I can say that relates a little bit to the finance, which is a little bit harder to make, is that Doing it in a controlled environment is, means that you basically get very efficient use of materials and you know very tight envelope, which has all kinds of other little knock-on effects. So it's a very high, highly technical solution, 
which again is not normal for affordable housing, but it made sense here for a variety of reasons. And the construction did run several months ahead of schedule. Now we, this building was built in a period of you know, historically low interest rates, but had we been in a more normal period, you know, the construction interest payment you know, on a building of, that's of this magnitude you know, could have been a significant savings. Hello. I actually uh, live not too far from this uh, project, and I'm, I'm pretty excited about it relative to the other affordable housing that's been going up in the area. But I do have some concerns, um, and I think a lot of it has to do with the, the, the density of, of the project itself, because you know, at this point in time, it looks great, um, but I can think of some other uh, sort of high-density uh, affordable housing projects in the Bronx that have you know, great amenities, uh, but uh, haven't panned out over the years. Uh, in the South Bronx, there's a Concourse Village where you have everybody has a balcony with views of the city. Uh, it's still, you know, a very <laughs> nasty place. Um, there's Peter Eisman's project uh, up by the uh, Robert Roberto Clemente Park. They have a state park, but again, it's an, that, that project is an anchor holding down the community. In, at least in my opinion. And then if going further north, you have Tracy Towers, which has you know, uh, a large number of amenities, and it's, it too is almost an anchor to the community rather than a boon. And I think you know, it maybe has to do with maintenance, or uh, I, I, don't, I don't know. It's, I, it's, it's, I think it's uh, the density and then the lack of maintenance. Uh, just uh, great ideas. Uh, you know, just aren't panning out in the long term. And I'm wondering whether this, this thing that appears great now will pan out or whether or not it's going to be a future, uh, you know, representation of those previous projects. I, that's a great question. I mean, really come back in 20 years. Um, it's hard to say. I mean, I've thought a lot about that because I'm aware of the projects uh, uh, that you mentioned, and there, there are other examples of you know high ideals and 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 great visions that you know sort of uh, uh, break up in 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 coming across you know what really happens. And I hope that's not the case for Via Verde. I think we've in the design uh, we've tried to be sensitive. It's not purely a high-rise project. It's you know not it's mixed income. It's mixed ownership rental. It's mixed height. Uh, it has sort of an integrated central focus in the uh, courtyard and the other outdoor spaces. So I think there are a lot of physical uh, reasons why uh, this project has hopefully a better uh, chance of success than, than some of the projects you've mentioned. Um, I also think that uh, with uh, FIPS as the uh, managing the project, you have a New York's really leading uh, manager of affordable housing with tremendous experience both on the good and frankly and sometimes not so good of what works and what doesn't work um, so i think there's a lot of commitment to make this project work but you know in the end only time will tell there, there, there is a real difference um, in kind of newer newer housing programs versus the older ones it's a much more driven by the owner type of model than the sort of heyday of 60s and 70s type of programs where most of those high rises were built. Uh, it's actually less, not that we aren't heavily regulated, but it's less regulated than, than say a Mitchell Lama kind of regime. There's a lot more ability for the owner to spend money in ways to maintain the building. I mean, I think that should be helpful. I think the income mix is a big thing, but probably even more so at a more detailed level, it's tenant selection. So we have a couple of very bad properties that would probably be comparable to the ones that you were listing. There, but there are only a couple of them, and the reasons they're that way is that we had no control over tenant selection. Is that they were part of were renewal projects in the 70s where people that were part of whatever was torn down all had a right to return. We didn't have any ability to check credit. We didn't have any ability to do background checks. And as a result, you have a tenancy that's, uh, you know, that doesn't pan out so well over time. And I think the, the newer models allow for much more of the tenant selection that any normal landlord would do. Not that we're doing anything weird or anything overly onerous, 
but you're allowed to make the kinds of decisions that, that any landlord makes. And the demand for the housing is so high, you know, as you saw, in, I think it was uh, Elizabeth's slide, you, know, you have 7,000 applications for 133 apartments. That's a pretty selective, we can be pretty selective when you go through a group that large. And I think those are the things you have to rely upon. And hopefully they work. I mean, I think if you look at the newer model, which is basically sort of a mid-80s onward model, I don't think you see any of the projects like you mentioned in that group of projects. Right, there's so actually there's a, very few environments. There's a fundamentally different financing mechanism that's used to do affordable housing today. So, I mean, I, my heart goes out to NYCHA. They have a Mission Impossible. And the mechanism there is, let's suppose it takes $100 um, you know, a year to, to properly manage a, a unit. The idea there is that they're counting on every year getting from the feds, say, $50. So every single year, they've got to get $50 to achieve the $100 they need. And you know, essentially, as budgets have been cut, what happens is that the feds say, sorry, we're not going to give you that money anymore. You need $100 to run this unit, but we're going to only give you 50 Good luck. And that you know, is very, very difficult for them. The new model is that you actually write down the cost at the very beginning so that you can actually operate that building on what you would actually collect from the tenants. So you're not needing to have an ongoing annual subsidy that would be cut. So the idea is all your subsidy happens up front. It's partially why these projects are so expensive. But then in the long run, you're not expecting to get money year after year after year after year from the government to actually operate the buildings. And I think that's really a really fundamental change in sort of how affordable housing projects are structured these days. I think that's really good. And I just wanted to add one more thing, which is that um, my background is in <coughs> urban sociology. I'm actually not a housing policy person or do anything related to real estate finance. Um, but I've, I've spent a fair amount of time in public housing buildings, in communities of various kinds, different socioeconomic groups, and now most recently in affordable housing here in New York City. And I think one of the, in addition to some of these shifts in financial models, which really was learning from past mistakes um, in relation to sort of towers in the park models um, that, and then having means tested rents that just couldn't sustain basic maintenance and all those things. Um, the second component of this is really what we've learned um, from uh, the social side of how we build communities and recognizing that buildings are more than just roofs and apartments and places for people to be warehoused who don't have resources to live elsewhere. Um, and this is really, I think at the core, a huge part of why Via Verde is so exciting to me is because it really has these aspects and these um, design concepts that help to actively support people engaging in community building and interaction and neighboring. Um, and that that really shifts how people actually inhabit buildings and the need for basic maintenance things, uh, above and beyond tenant selection, which we're very cautious about making sure that we have fair housing policies, but um, that, that this is really about helping people, um, not only individual behaviors to eat healthier, to exercise, but m even more important is to actually engage in sort of a, a broader community where they're, they're connected, they're engaged, they're happy, they're invested in the future, and not just for oneself, but also for the people around them in the same building. Yeah, I think that's actually something you said a different way, but I think the key thing for me in the project and what we are very optimistically hoping, as we say, will really work out is that it creates a sense of identity and ownership for the residents that we really hope and ex expect them to kind of really cherish. And it seems to have been that way so far in terms of the, the, you know, the responses that we're getting, but it was by intent in terms of making sure that we're designing something that will have a real sense of connection for people and creating opportunities for them to really respect it and, and to cherish it and make it something that's theirs, you know? I mean, basically, that could be summed up as that the building is, the Via Verde is a social contract. Mm -hmm. And and so just, I think that the, the New York City has learned a great deal. I think this is, is a very, very sophisticated presentation. Have you run across any, um, have you, any of you have any experience of exporting this type of idea from New York City? Like, does this work in, I mean, you know, Amal, in, in, in the foreclosure scenario, does, the things, the lessons learned here in, in New York City, does this export to other markets in other places for the rest of the country, or are we still singularly um, New York City? 
Um, I actually, I serve on the ULI Affordable Housing Council, which is a nationwide council. And, you know, and I always, I always, you know, have to remind myself how incredibly lucky we are to live in New York City from the point of view of affordable housing. Um, we have an incredibly sophisticated public sector that has a very transparent set of programs. We have an amazing not-for-profit sector, amazing group of community development. So, I mean, there, there are uh, the confluence of a lot of different factors that make New York City really an amazing place to do very, very high quality affordable housing. Um, within the U.S., the other city that rivals it is San Francisco, has a terrific uh, affordable housing program. You know, I feel like Chicago is trying very, very hard. Um, Boston, you know, the, Boston has got great things going. Washington's quickly transforming itself. Um, but it really is, you know, sort of the great big, you know, urban centers that I think, you know, have sophistication and frankly enough density to sort of do affordable housing right, at least in the U.S. Yeah, there's one group actually that we've interacted with in Canada tr called Toronto Community Housing, which actually do have a pretty progressive uh, portfolio of work and things that have been doing and they're planning on doing, which is interesting. Yeah, I mean, I think um, the thing that really is different about New York is the scale, but not just because New York is big. It's the scale of, of investment. I mean, to, to basically beginning with Koch and, and even in the Giuliani administration, New York spent vastly more money than anybody else does. And then Bloomberg kind of doubled, tripled, quadrupled down what Giuliani was doing. And that level is really different. I mean, there was a point where the stat was that New York spends more than the next 50 cities combined. And the next 50 cities combined, you know, aren't a 50th of New York size. They're many times New York size. And the fact that we've had mayors who have chosen to use our much better tax base. I mean, we have a local income tax. We have more money. We have more rich people. We have other, other resources. And the fact that they've been prescient enough to spend that is totally to their credit. And that I don't think you've seen anywhere else in, the, in this country. I mean, I'm very proud of the fact that Via Verde is going to be, you know, one of the legacy buildings of the Bloomberg administration. But, you know, I think it's just very worth noting that an affordable housing building is going to be a legacy building of the Bloomberg administration. And I think that, you know, that is not, it's, it's not a football stadium. It's not, you know, those which you might find. Well, we did try that. Oh, we did try that. <laughs> but it's not what you would, I think, maybe find in other cities in terms of sort of what the, uh, you know, mayor was focusing on. Um, if I can just add one thing, which is that, I mean, we were talking earlier about taking the design elements of Via Verde and sort of breaking them down into things that then could be applied. And I think very much on sort of a different scale, that's what all of this work in New York City represents, at least potentially represents for the rest of the country. I mean, I spend a lot of time, as I mentioned, none of our funding comes from anywhere in New York City. So I spend a lot of time out on the road talking to funders and other housing groups and developers and other cities and residents in other cities when I'm on the road. Um, and it's really interesting for us to use that dialogue as a way to understand what is different about what we do, uh, what may or may not be applied, and frankly, what doesn't work there that actually we might be able to bring home and make work. Mm -hmm. um, that's, I mean, I'm not speaking from the design architectural perspective or even the financing, but there's a lot of that talking across those bridges. Um, and I think some of what we do um, actually could be done in other cities, maybe implemented in a slightly different way within that context. But certainly the ideas and the inspiration behind it, I think, can be applied if it's careful. Uh, thank you. Uh, could you uh, describe the sound damping requirement between adjacent apartments? And is, is there more than sheetrock and stud? Because so often stress is derived from noise pollution. I just wondered how you address that. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I, yes, there is, I mean, the interior partitions are sheetrock and metal stud, but we do have insulation. And one of the things we did that has some acoustic value, but also air quality value, is that uh, uh, the apartments are very well sealed and isolated from one another. In fact, we've had a little bit of difficulty in passing what's called the blower door test, where a testing agency comes in, installs a big fan, sucks air out, and see where the apartment's leaking, not only from the exterior, but on the demising walls between apartments and the contractors had to come back and put in more sealant and you know really pay attention to like the gaps around outlets and uh, uh, you know cracks at the top of the wall or the bottom of the wall and correct those conditions and by doing that we're going to increase the uh, acoustical performance um, and also increase uh, uh, or enhance at least the air quality by not letting odors drift from 
uh, uh, one apartment to another. I'd also mention that uh, in the mid-rise uh, section of the building, the duplexes, uh, I mentioned early on that the, the duplexes are uh, masonry bearing wall and precast plank. Unlike typical buildings where the masonry ba bearing wall is parallel to the street and the plank, the precast concrete planks run perpendicular to the street, in this case, the uh, bearing walls are the demising partitions between the units so that in the case of the duplexes you actually have a concrete block wall between units which will also enhance uh, uh, acoustic performance. All right. well, thank you all. This was really uh, inspiring. So thank you all for, for coming and sharing uh, the Via Verde with us. Thank you.